hour and a half left together. So I'm going to move us forward, okay? So if you see me skipping slides, just try to keep up with me. I'm going to hold this slide here, and I'm going to go on to number eight in our rules of fair fighting. Okay, so just to review, let me see here. Okay, so we talked about arguing to resolve, not to win the argument, staying in the here and now, not going to old, old business, using I statements, which are reflective of a, your basic need or your core values, being honest and accurate and not exaggerating, figuring out your needs from your wants. Then we talked about good active listening skills. And then we last talked about using good customer service skills, which is that agree with them, apologize, and use the word and instead of but. All right? Believe me, if you try this in your next argument, you'll be surprised at, at what a difference it makes. Okay, so let me, I'm going to slide eight. Here we go. Okay. Now this one's really going to cause your head to spin. <laughs> This, accept every apology offered. So I have to say that if you want somebody to accept your apologies, you need to be willing to accept theirs. We have something in our culture that makes us believe that an apology is not really an apology unless they feel bad. So we then get caught in the trap of forcing kids to apologize to each other. And when I say this, I know I'm going to cause some heads to spin. But I don't, or I ask teachers and parents not to require their kids to say, I'm sorry. I'm going to say that again. I ask parents and teachers not to require the kids to say, I'm sorry, when they do something. This is a little controversial because they think that I'm turning their kids into sociopaths. And maybe I am. <laughs> but on the off chance that I'm not, let me explain why. When we ask two kids who have just argued or fought or had some type of a disagreement or one hit the other person, and we say, tell them you're sorry, what, what it, why are we doing that? Anyone? I'm sorry? Make the other one feel better. To make them feel better? Okay. The victim. We'll call that person the victim. To make them feel better. What makes them feel better? Exactly. We want the other person to feel bad, right? Now, going back to what I said about we can't make anybody feel anything. Can you really teach somebody to feel guilt? Think about it. I've been through lots of coursework, and I've never come across a class where they teach somebody to feel guilt or remorse. Either you do or you don't. So when we say, tell Johnny that you're sorry for hitting him, and Billy says, I'm sorry, then what's... Johnny's supposed to do with that? Is he supposed to, okay, I forgive you, even though he knows it wasn't heartfelt? I think we set kids up and set ourselves up because those kids grow up to become adults to invest in the words, I'm sorry, only if the person is truly contrite. And I don't know that we can make people feel guilty. I think what happens when we require kids to say I'm sorry is that we piss them off. I'm sorry for saying it that way, but I think we do. I think we make them angry because we have taken them from an equal position and forced them down into a lower position. And if they were comfortable in that position in the first place, they never would have hit the other one. So I think that when we require them to say I'm sorry, it makes them mad. And so they'll say I'm sorry, but they don't feel it. Now picture this. That kid Johnny hit Billy, okay? And he knew that it was wrong. And instead of being told 
to say I'm sorry, he had the chance to learn how Billy felt about getting hurt. Would that have a more lasting impact on him? Chances are it would. Maybe not right away, but later on it will. So if, if we're saying to him, say you're sorry, say you're sorry, and Johnny says, I'm sorry, and doesn't feel it, then he grows up feeling like apologies are not acceptable. Or insincere. Yes? I missed kind of what you said before. There's a movie, Bowie. Have you guys seen the documentary? Where the administrator actually made the two kids apologize to each other. Mm -hmm. You see it right there, how ineffective it was. But you don't even know what happened in your playground. How can you bring this kid in who's being bullied to say, I'm sorry to his bully, the person who's being the bully? We can't make, thank you, thank you. That's an excellent point. We can't make kids feel it. But we can explain the feelings behind what it, like, what it feels like to be bullied or victimized or pe teased in some way. We can explain that and, and hope that they get it and that they understand it. Yeah? I just have a question for students who are young, like early childhood or kindergarten, who don't have the language and they don't have that language model at home, then how would you bridge that gap for them to even know that apologizing is an option for them? I think that you can say when they, and this is, you're talking early formation of language, okay? And so the sorry is a real quick thing that you can do and you feel better about it, right? I don't know that the other kid feels better about it. I don't know that the, the kid who's receiving the apology ever feels better about it. And so you can go ahead and do the action and you say, if you feel this later on, if you feel guilty about it and explain guilt, then later on you might want to apologize for it. So I'm not saying eliminate apologies out of your vocabulary. Quite the opposite. I'm saying apologize for everything and accept every apology, right? So it sounds a little counterintuitive. There's that paradox thing here, okay? I think that if kids understand what impact their behavior has on other kids, they will learn empathy. And when they learn empathy, they learn guilt and remorse as opposed to a hollow measure that says, I'm sorry. Somebody had mentioned earlier about the high school student, or was that in the conversation, who says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over and over again. Well, what do you feel better with receiving that apology? No. You'd rather have an apology that's heartfelt, right? But in an argument, an apology has a very subtle way of bringing the person back to the table. So it sounds like I'm saying two different things, doesn't it? First I'm saying, don't force anybody to say I'm sorry. Then I'm saying, say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. Apologize for anything. Apologize for nuclear war, or famine in Africa, or something. Apologize for something in the argument. And it sounds confusing. And I'll explain it this way. If you don't get any indication that the other person across that table wants to resolve this conflict with you, then you'll never reach a compromise. Because you'll always stand your ground again and again and again. And you may offer the olive branch and they may take it and beat you over the head with it. But if you offer the olive branch two or three times in an argument by apologizing for some part of it, and the other person doesn't say anything, I think you have a right at that point, or an opportunity at that point to say, look, I have apologized for three things in this argument because I'm trying to resolve it, and you haven't apologized for anything. It doesn't seem like you want to resolve this. It seems like you want to win it. And that gets their attention. Because when we call it out, look, you want to win the argument or resolve the argument? We always say, oh, we want to resolve, we want to resolve. We're benevolent, but I want to win, darn it. <laughs> I want the other person to say I'm wrong. So if you go to the table and you apologize for something, please make it as heartfelt as you can, okay? You don't have to admit that you're wrong in the apology in order for it to stick. It has an effect. Negotiations on big levels Okay, on treaty levels with between countries. Follow this same model. The language is important. 
they apologize for whatever they can apologize for, and they whatever is non-negotiable that they can't arrive at any type of agreement on gets put off into the corners, and they focus in on what they can agree on. The apology does not have to be fully realized as long as you are legitimately sorry for whatever it is that you're saying. If you're saying, I'm, s <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if you say something to the effect of, I'm sorry you feel that way. So, do you believe that I'm really sorry that you feel that way? No. In fact, I would avoid that phrase at all costs. <laughs> I would put that one on my do not do list because I think it's patronizing. I'm sorry you feel that way. Sounds like there's something inherently wrong with you that you feel that way. So when you say, I'm sorry that my actions are hurting you. I'm sorry that we're arguing. I don't like arguing with you. I'm sorry that we can't seem to find some type of a solution to this. Those are legitimate apologies that you can make and never once say to the other person, you're wrong. That apology has a subtle influence on us and brings us back to the table again and again and again. And once you incorporate this little uh, dialogue back and forth, it shows up in your arguments over and over again and your arguments get shorter and less intense. Shorter and less intense. Because you, you know that you need to apologize for something. I, myself, always apologize for three things. I figure out whatever I can say to apologize for three things. In my last argument with my partner, when we were arguing and he was going blah, 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 and I finally said, look, I've apologized three times for how, for how I reacted in this situation. You haven't apologized for anything. The phone was silent. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm sorry we're arguing. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. In my, I was trying not to be condescending, but I was a little bit, darn it. So I think it's helpful to, to use apologies as a, as a way of resolving conflict. Not to win it, to resolve it. Big key. Everything goes back to that first one. Any questions about this? Yes? I know you're saying like spouse or partner. When you say, I'm sorry to feel that way, or like I try to, even with like students, my children, my husband, they call it the teacher voice. Mm -hmm. The teacher sign, the teacher voice, whatever. And that becomes their button. When you try to control and say, okay, we need to back up. Mm -hmm. So do you have advice for that? Because yeah. Because the teacher voice becomes the button for other people. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to that striking while the iron's cool thing that I talked about earlier, okay? When you're in the midst of an argument, emotions are really raw. and. So people become hypersensitive to things. But when emotions are not in the, the picture and you're dealing with a rational human being, you can set ground rules for how you argue. And in doing so, you talk about why you're going to use this type of language. It's not to insult them. It's not to hurt them. It's because we're working towards resolution. That's where I want to go. And if you're not in an argument, you, they'll hear it. But if you're, if you're using that in the middle of an argument, they won't hear it. If they're so enraged at that point, anything you say is going to be, be viewed as, as having some malicious intent. So, With cooler heads, you're saying at that time, right. the reason I get into my teacher voice mode is because I see that we're not resolving this conflict and I'm trying to get us back on track. It's not to make you feel inadequate or guilty, or it's just because I want us to resolve it. Precisely. Striking while the iron's cool. So look for those moments after an argument or before the next argument when you guys are calm. Now, it, you have to be a little proactive here. You have to kind of sit down with the person when it's on your mind and say, hey, can we talk about something? I'm not really happy with how we argue. It seems like when we argue, we, we just want to beat each other up. And I don't like that at all. I'd much rather work on resolving our conflicts as opposed to winning them. Can, how do you feel about that? And kind of open up the discussion so you're talking about the process as opposed to the issue. And if you stay focused in on the process, oftentimes in an argument, you can actually reduce the conflict. It, those of you who are counselors or social workers who have actually been in therapy with somebody, when, you, when the person's so angry and they're just going off about something, and it's not about you, but they're just going off and off and off and off, and their body language is all over the place, isn't it helpful sometimes to just speak to the process? Wow, you really seem angry. 
you really, I mean, this is really affecting you a lot. You may not have a good answer for them or any advice whatsoever, but just speaking to the process is, is acknowledging their pain, acknowledging their, their emotions, and that in and of itself is valuable. Okay, can we move on? Cool. Okay, and then be open to compromise. So I put this towards the end here because we can't start off with compromise right from the very beginning. We have to get level-headed before we can actually get to a compromise state. If, if you're ready to negotiate and the other person's ready to, to beat you over the head, then compromise is not going to work, okay? When you talk with folks who have been, who have quote unquote compromised in situations, in argu heated arguments and, and in political strategies and stuff, the person who says that they compromised is the person who got everything that they wanted. The other person said they capitulated, which is a big difference. So if once you're both in a point where you're ready to negotiate and you can focus in on your needs, not your wants, focus in on the process, control your language, and you realize that there's an openness and ready to, to negotiate, then you can work on a compromise. But if you go in with the, the mentality that you're going to win this argument and the other person just has to say that they're wrong, you'll never get here. You'll never get here. And lastly, make good use of timeouts when needed, okay? Because sometimes we need to model that behavior. <laughs> Although duct taping the baby to the refrigerator is not necessarily the best timeout. I thought that's brilliant. Can you imagine how long they had to hold that baby up there and and it's so jagged it makes you wonder were they mad when they did that? No, this type of timeout makes a lot more sense, okay? I don't know about you, but sometimes I get so angry that I'm, I, I become irrational. And so I, at that point I need to step back and I need to collect my thoughts. And I've modeled it myself and I ask my kids to do it. We ask our kids all the time, take a time out if you're too angry. Take a time out if you're too angry. But how often have you actually done that? And if you're not modeling that behavior and showing them and say, look, you know what, I need, I need a minute. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, uh, I'm dangerously close to saying something I don't want to say. And so I need to, to calm down a little bit. And then come back to it. Chances are the timeout not only helps you, but it helps them because you're not bumping heads on it. All right. Okay, so role play, rule, 10 rules of fair fighting. So, um, I need to count how many people we have here. Thirty-three, and how many do we have on this side? We have 22, so we need to send five people over to this side, please. Can, can five people volunteer to just participate? You don't have to pick up and move your stuff, just go on over. Okay. That's one, two, three, four. We could do it. I think we can. I think we can. I think we can. Five. New person. That's all right. I think we'll be okay. Okay, so can you guys pass these out? Take one of them. And the same thing on this side. Pass these out and take one. Okay? Then you're going to find somebody who has the same or the, the next letter. So you'll see that the... I'm having a hard time explaining this. They are role play scenarios, okay? And so you have M, N, so any M's that are over here, look for an N over here to partner with. P and Q, any P over here needs to look for a Q over on this side. S over here needs to look for a T, and U needs to look for a V. So at the top of your paper, you'll see a letter. So go ahead and hold your finger, your, your letter up if it's T or U or whatever and match with somebody. So we have a P that needs a Q. 
Okay, so now that you are partnered up with somebody who has S's and T's are together, U's and B's are together, P's and Q's, blah, blah, blah. Now you're partnered up. Read your role play scenario from your perspective. Please don't show it to your, your partner. Okay? And then discuss how you guys are going to argue. So I want you to role play the argument that's there. And then hopefully you will use up to three of the rules of fair fighting. And I'm going to put them back up here so you can see them. Okay? I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do this. Okay, if you don't want to share your role play, maybe you could talk about what you did. Would that be fine? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's fine. S and a T. Yeah, you'll need to get some background information. If they stand up, it's easier for the interpreters. That would be great. Um, so basically, we are fighting about I am at work and my spouse is at home recently got laid off. So he or she is feeling the need that they're doing everything and I'm lazy because I get home from work and I'm tired. So <laughs> our argument, yeah. it started with um, me going to say, you, what, you're not here at not helping around the house. You're still working, but you're not helping around the house when you get home. And then we change it to an I. I feel like you're not helping with the household chores that need to be done. And I said, I agree that I could help out more. And I asked, I, could you compromise by picking one chore that you could commit to every day? And I said, I would love to do the dishes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> because dishes can make or break a marriage, right? And then I said, well, if we're compromising, I would also like 10 minutes when I get home to de-stress, and then I will jump on those dishes. Beautiful, beautiful. Any feedback, anybody? <laughs> thank you, thank you. That wasn't so hard. Okay, can we get somebody else who had one of the other letter combinations? Okay. Thank you. Standing would probably help the interpreters. Thank you. Our scenario, which I'm a parent, and I insist on a certain bedtime, and my child does not want to go to bed at that time because they feel like they're getting too old to bed at that time. So, I just made, I just let her say what she wanted, so I did some listening, and I, and I cleared, there was some clarification, so what you're saying is, um, and then I said, so what is your solution to the problem? Because my, I feel that, based on past experience, that if you don't go to bed at this hour, you are very crabby the next morning, and you fall And she said, well, all my friends, you bring in your friends, and I said, okay, what they do in their parents is a different discussion. This is you and I speaking about our situation. And she, I said, what would be a good time for you? And she only went up a half an hour, which I thought was really okay. So I said, okay, so let me make sure that I hear what you're saying. You would be happy if I take it up to half an hour. And then we went into a compromise, and I said, let's try this for a week. Let's see, after a week, if if things are okay, you're not sleeping in school, you're not crabby in the morning, then that's great, we'll, we'll continue. But if it is, are you okay with us going back to 8.30? And she said, yes, but if it, if it is good, can we up it again? I said, I said, let's get past the first. Staying in the here and now. And then we can, we can further discuss this later on, so that was our session. Fantastic. One of the other groups? Come on. Thank you. We're you and B. So, strict parent versus more permissive parent. Okay. I think my partner is very strict and 
I have now undermined my partner a little bit by saying you're, to my child, you're ungrounded when <laughs> the other parent grounded. So okay. furious, yelling at me. And so I apologized for not consulting my partner about our co-parenting as we should have been doing. Okay. My apology was not accepted. I was mad. She was she furious. Was mad. She kept going. So then I, you know, let her vent a little bit and listened actively. And then, and then we, I, I think I apologized again, but was not accepted again. But eventually I said, you're right, I should have discussed what we should have done with our child who didn't do our homework, that I felt that it was too strict of a consequence and that perhaps a compromise would be to agree that for this offense that would be the consequence. And that we agreed and agreed not to undermine. She apologized the third time. I think I apologized again. <laughs> it was very hard because I would never do this in real life. <laughs> I mean, it's us against them, you know. <laughs> That's how our, my partnership works. I mean, right. them and us. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So. You used the apology three times and then she finally accepted it. You also looked for compromise, trying to come up with some type of solution, and you took it outside of yourselves and then had a, agreed on a code of conduct that would list the consequences for the various transgressions, right? That then you could just refer to that and it takes the emotion out of it, right? Correct. That sounds like an excellent idea. Good job. Thank you. Last group. Who's brave enough? Come on, I'm not going to bite your heads off. All right. Um, P and Q. Um, we actually were twin girls. Twin teenage girls. And then our mother. Uh, she went out of town for the weekend with the husband. And the two of us had a party. <laughs> and we, um, there was a fight. And then the cops showed up. And parents came home, furious, of course. Said right away, she said, you're grounded. And we rebelled. We fought against that. We said, well, it's not our fault. We took care of the cops while, you know, you know, we argued. <laughs> we handled the cops just fine, you know. And we argued with her. But then the mom kind of just, she just said, well, you know what? I I feel, I see that you guys are upset. I can't remember exactly what you said. It was beautiful. But <laughs> we had no choice but to come up with a compromise she said that like and then after we all calmed down the next time this happened because we were stuck because many of our friends showed up unexpectedly so she gave us a way how to handle that situation next time gave a compromise that the next time because she has a few conferences to go we can have a few friends over and have a movie and popcorn order pizza it was a fair compromise so you, you guys both had the presence of mind to be able to to agree on a compromise. Did you, was there, not initially though. No, we argued for a while. Okay, and how did you resolve that part? What, I don't know, you said something wonderful. <laughs> you said, um, yeah, no. Like she re she recognized our feeling, she, she could, she like acknowledged that we were scared and upset because we didn't really intend to have the party to begin with. She acknowledged that and said that when you, you know. And she told us how to handle it next time, which mm -hmm. I think the Say first no. time, it just, we were overwhelmed because kids kept showing up. And so that, and we tried to handle it the best we can. But now that we have tools, oh, and we know what to do the next time, I think we'll be more responsible. Wonderful, wonderful, really. <laughs> Okay, so go, you can return back to your places if you'd like. There are some obvious benefits from being able to argue fairly. And once you develop the skill to argue fairly, you can use it with whatever age group that's out there. And I want to acknowledge the fact that a question did come up, how do you use these skills with lower functioning deaf kids or lower functioning kids in general? And I'm putting that on the parking lot over there, so I'll, I'll address that later. If there's anything else that you wonder, how does this apply to something, we can throw it up on the parking lot. Yes? So a lot of times as teachers, we know these things and we are the, I don't know, 
level-headed one, and the kids are the ones that are like not doing these types of things. Mm -hmm. so how do you like switch your mindset? Oh, you don't know what I'm saying. How do we help how do we kids help like fair too? Yeah. Thanks. So again, I go back to the issue when you try if you try to intervene in one of those situations where the tempers are up like that, you're not going to be very successful. But if you do some type of psychoeducational group beforehand and talk about ground rules and then you reimpose them and reinforce them, you have visuals and you just again and again and again. With kids, it may be very difficult because they're lacking a part of their brain that we as adults have and they frequently just run off on, on you know, the amygdala and the limbic system. So it, it takes some reinforcing it over and over and over again. I don't think it's enough to just put a sign up here and say rules for fair fighting and call it a day. I think that you need to review them regularly and use teachable moments throughout your day when there could be an argument about something and then after the argument's resolved, go back through and then dissect it and, get, and reinforce it over and over again and it becomes part of the climate of your classroom. Is that helpful? Whew. Thank goodness. <laughs> Any other questions about the fair fighting piece? No? Okay. So there are some obvious uh, benefits for fair fighting. You work towards a solution, you model the behavior for others, and your arguments get resolved a whole lot quicker. And there's a lot less resentment, so your relationships get maintained as well. Okay, so now, Learn to recognize power struggles and how to avoid them. Now we get into the fun stuff. So what exactly is a power struggle? I think the Webster def definition I have up here is two people engaged in a struggle for dominance, each equally committed to winning. <clears throat> so remember who jo Jeff Foxworthy was? Or is? He's still alive. <laughs> so he had that you might be a redneck if, right? So. <clears throat> I have, you might be in a power struggle if. Okay, so before I do that, the truth about power struggles, everyone goes to greater and greater lengths to win because dominance is your goal, right? And it severely damages the relationship and you end up with a belly full of resentment, which isn't helpful at all. So, you might be in a power struggle, let's see here, by the way, a lack of experience, unrealistic expectations, and under, misunderstanding the difference between discipl discipline and punishment. Do you guys need to know what that, the difference is there? Yes, no? Okay, so we know that discipline is designed to teach them to control themselves. Punishment is designed to make them feel bad so we feel better about teaching them. So when you're using punishment, if you say, stay in that chair until I'm calm, that's punishment because you're doing it so that you feel better. When you give a punishment, what typically happens is the kid learns to control the behavior for that situation, but they don't generalize it to other situations. And after the threat of punishment is gone, they go back to the behavior. Discipline teaches kids to make better decisions overall so that they don't need to be disciplined. Okay, so you might be in a power struggle if, number one, you need to win. Right? We said, if you feel like you have to win the argument, you're probably in a power struggle. Two, if you get louder, and by louder I mean verbally louder or your signs get bigger. If you find that you're getting louder, you're probably becoming emotionally involved in the argument, and in which case you're losing your objectivity. And probably because you want to win. So. Be cognizant of the fact when you find that your signs are getting really big and your signing box is getting big and everything is getting very aggressive. This is one of my favorites. If you solicit support from the troops. <laughs> so this is where you go around to everybody else and you, and you get them to side with you because you want them on your side. My sister Jane's famous for this. She would, she would call me up and she would kvetch about one of her kids. She had seven kids, by the way. And so when I would give her my honest opinion, she'd say, whose side are you on anyways? i say, I'm not on a side, I'm just offering an opinion. But if you find that you're going out trying to get other people to be angry at the person that you're angry with, or trying to get people to, to, just, or to agree with you so you feel justified in being so angry, chances are you're in a power struggle. If you increase the punishment, 
So I don't know if you saw Fer Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Do you remember that movie from way back when? He said, okay, so you're, you got detention for a week. Do you want a month? Go ahead, say something else. Okay, you got a month. You want the whole year? Say something else. So when you increase the consequences in challenging them, then you're probably in a power struggle. And why are you doing that? Because you want to win. And the only thing that you have, the only leverage you have, is consequences. So you increase the consequences over and over again in order to be able to get the, the kid to back down or the, the other adult. If you pull rank unnecessarily, now sometimes it's important to say it's my, it's my classroom, that's why. Because you, know, you get the kid who asks you why, 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 why. And eventually you say because I'm the boss, that's it. <laughs> Okay, end the discussion, and that's fine. I'm not saying that that's not fine, because if you're ending the discussion at that point, then it's fine. But if you're pulling rank unnecessarily, and you're in intentionally throwing your rank down their throat, you don't run nothing. This is my classroom. This is my house. You got no rights whatsoever. Then chances are you're probably in a power struggle. If you hit below the belt, these are those statements that we make. The moment they come out of our mouths, we're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Should not have said that. Like, it's not my fault your mother's a drug addict. <laughs> it's not my fault that your, your parents are never home and they don't love you enough to help you with your homework. It's not my fault that you're in foster care. We say these hurtful things because we're caught up in the emotion. And quite frankly, we know if we say it, it'll hurt. And after we say it, we realize, ooh, how awful that was. <laughs> and sometimes we don't say how awful it is. Sometimes we keep hitting below the belt. When you're hitting below the belt and doing these very unfair things, chances are you're deeply entrenched in a power struggle. When you use absolutes, and I'm not talking the vodka here. <laughs> We use absolutes such as always, never, constantly, forever. These words leave no room for negotiation. And so they take a person and they lock them into a behavior or a description that they can't get out of. It's very unfair. So when I went back to, and I hate to pick on the person who said earlier that he talks all the time, and I said, does he talk in a sleep too? She was using an absolute. Okay, and we tend to do that because from our perspective it is all the time. But in reality, it's just a lot. Maybe it's not even a lot, it's just really bad when it happens. And so when you use absolutes, you're exaggerating the claim so you have a better justification for your reason as to why you should win. So you, I would recognize if you start throwing out those words like never, always, forever, constantly, those types of words are really unfair and they only tend to irritate the other person. If you bring up old business, okay, we talked about that before, staying in the here and now. If you bring up that stuff from before or previous arguments, in that beautiful attempt to connect the dots so that we can prove a, a pattern of behavior, if you bring that up in the argument, you're trying to win the argument. Okay, as I said before, there's a time and a place to be able to bring that stuff up when tempers are cool, after the argument's over with, not five minutes after the argument's over with, maybe at the next day or so to go back and revisit it and strike while the iron's cool to talk about that stuff, to kind of dissect it. But if you're bringing it up in the middle of the argument, you're feeling like your argument's not strong enough to win as it is, so you, you need more ammunition. If you give a hundred answers or rationales to something, so the kid shot down your first answer, and then they, they found holes in your logic in the second answer, and then the third answer why they have to do something, and the fourth answer, and then you start scrambling. If you're scrambling, you're probably in a power struggle because at that point you feel like you have to justify yourself, and so therefore you're going to, you probably will go back and pull rank unnecessarily there. But if you find yourself giving a ton of different answers to the same question because you want to get the kid to do whatever it is that you need to do it, then you're probably in a power struggle. A better approach to that would be something along the lines of, I'm feeling really frustrated because I, I've asked you to do something and I need you to do it, and I feel like you don't feel it, it's very important to you. So going from that perspective. 
And then lastly, if you need to have the last word. Okay, okay, I know, you're guilty of it. What happens is we say, okay, I'm going to be the adult, I'm going to give you the last word. So in the argument, you have the last word. And then the kid goes, blah, 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 blah. And then what do you do? Okay, discussion closed. Who just had the last word? You did. Does the kid know it? Yeah, they do. They do. You said I could have the last word. And the, the argument continues to go, okay? So please be the adult. Let them have the last word. It, it, nobody wins the argument. Who, the person who has the last word isn't the winner of the argument. The person who's the loudest isn't the one who wins the argument. The person who has more people who believe in their side doesn't win the argument because there's no winning arguments. You, if you win an argument, that means somebody else loses. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. Okay. So how do you resolve and avoid power struggles? I mentioned that I'm Adlerian, that I come from the perspective that all behavior has some type of goal or purpose. And I believe, in my heart, I believe that that goal or purpose is rooted usually in some need, value, or belief to some degree. And so my belief is that if you can find a, a, a substitute behavior that still satisfies the need, then the kid or the adult, whatever the case may be, will actually buy into it because then they're no longer getting in trouble. That's my belief. Maybe I'm naive, but that's my belief. Okay, so let's talk about some core values and beliefs. First off, let's take, a, for example, the core value of fairness. Okay, a belief that's associated that is life is supposed to be fair. But do we know that life is fair? No, it's not. It's frequently not fair, okay? So Albert Ellis would probably say that's a masturbation. Life must be fair. In essence, though, what happens, a lot of our arguments stem from the fact that we have this belief or we value fairness. And so therefore, when life is not fair, somebody's not treating us fair, we react emotionally, right? We get angry when somebody's not treating us fairly. Whether it's being cut off in traffic unfairly or, or some presenter cutting in front of you in line at the lunch table <laughs> or something of that nature. So all of these cores, core values and beliefs affect our reactions, okay? So is anyone willing to say one of your deep core values? Anyone willing to go on the spot? Yes. Really ringing a bell with me because I'm looking because the other ones I'm saying okay I could see what an alternative belief is but when I read this one that says I should be able to make my own decisions I'm having a hard time saying okay what's an alternative belief to that one well so that's just me no I'm glad you raise it I don't know that it's necessarily an alternative belief if that's a core value it's a core value okay and and we it's hard to change our core values once they're entrenched, but we can provide options. So when you do forced choice options, you give, as you know, you give the person that you're giving the forced choice options, you can either do this or do that, then they choose between them. They're able to make their own decisions. So it, it, it satisfies that. If, they're, if the options that are on the table aren't what they want, then it's not going to satisfy that. So then maybe you need to expand what, what is it that you're looking for? What would you like to be able to do? I wish I can give you the ability to decide whatever you want to do. I wish you, I could tell you you could stay home from school forever. However, that's not the case. I'm sorry about that. And yeah, it's unfair. And you still need to go to school. Notice I didn't say but. And you still need to go to school. So talking about brainstorming options of being able to, to do it. So I put this up here not so much because I want you guys to try to refute the irrational belief that may be associated here, but so much to realize that the behavior that you're seeing is probably rooted in, in a core value such as this, which may be rational or maybe irrational. We don't know. And we may not be able to change it if it's irrational, but we can at least satisfy it in some way. So in power struggles, oftentimes this is the one that's in place here, especially for kids. They want to be the boss. I think it's a little confusing, to be honest with you, to kids when we tell them we want you to act more grown up, but then we won't give them responsibilities of a grown up. 
I think it's kind of a, a, a lose-lose situation or a double-bind situation. So we tell them, we want you, we want you to change. We want, we want you to, to be more mature. But the moment that they screw up once, all that change that they had done up until that point gets voided, and we go right back to the fact that you need to be more grown up. Well, they, they've accomplished a lot. And we feel that way too. You know, if you've ever had a performance evaluation where your supervisor said you need to improve on this area, and you start improving and start improving, and then you have a bad day, and you do the one thing that you were supposed to Im Im not do, then suddenly all the good is gone. So I think that that, yes? I think it's important to recognize those little steps too. Like you just said, you know, you're a, a teenager, or you're working on your job evaluation, and you're making all this progress, and you're making all this progress, as adults, it's hard for us to like keep working on that progress all that time if no one's recognizing it. As yeah. a teen or a young adult, it's even harder for them. Um, yeah, it's because the negative gets our attention. Yep. The, ne the negative is what gets our attention. We, we tend to overlook behavior that's praised. I can't tell you how many times I've had teachers tell me, I don't think I need to do a song and a dance for, for a kid who's doing what he should be doing anyways. Well. Yeah, you kind of do. If they are normally not doing that, and they're making changes, and they're moving forward, then yeah, do the song and the dance. You know, you want to invest in the change. I, the number of times that I've sat in IEP meetings over the years where they've got a goal for a kid, and the kid is working towards that goal, and then they backslide, and they completely overlook all the, the work that the kid has done on it. And they say, you know, you're out of here. That was a final strike. Well. Maybe it was a final strike at the time you drafted the plan, but look at all the improvement that's been done. And so if you want kids to change, you have to be willing to invest in that change and understand that they're gonna make mistakes along the way. It doesn't mean they stop trying, it just means it's a mistake. I think sometimes as adults, we have our belief that we send these messages to kids because, I don't remember the name of the book, the kid with autism, something they're curious to talk about. Oh, oh, yeah. Anyway, he says in there, when the kid has Asperger's, he says, you tell me to be honest, honest, honest. And so when I tell Aunt Martha that she stinks, because she smells, now I'm in trouble because I was honest. Look, and I think they're yeah. right. I think it's the fact that sometimes we send mixed messages. Well, there's an exception here, and there's an exception here, but they don't know all the exceptions. Right. And I believe that it's an exception. So sometimes I think, sometimes teenagers get mad at us because we send them these messages. Right, we want you to grow up, but then don't act like an adult and do adult things. You should just be a kid. And I think sometimes too, like, we try to force our beliefs on them or whatever, and so, um, just an example, like a kid not doing homework, well, it might be a kid that is, going home every night, their parents work, they're taking care of their younger siblings, they're doing a lot of things, so that core value is like totally different than right. what the teacher's expectation of getting that homework done. And so what, what do you think is going to happen when you you strike at the kid, that, or not strike at them, but you, you, you poke at that issue where they haven't gotten their homework done and they say, well, I'm taking care of my siblings, and you say, but you still need to get your homework done. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. How invested are you going to be to, to try and do the homework again? Because you're not acknowledging the core value. Any other comments about core values, beliefs? Okay. So, quick discussion. I'm going to give you guys mm, literally 90 seconds, a minute and a half, okay? Because you guys can go on and on and on and on. How are your core values and beliefs impacted in conflicts with your problem student? That one that we talked about early on in the day, where I asked you to, to write down the, the what, the where, the when, and what and who, but not the why. So how are your core values and beliefs impacted in conflicts with that student? Go ahead and discuss with the partner, please. And how did you respond when they weren't respected? I don't need you to share your, your personal conversations here, but I wanted to open up the, the idea to look at how your frustrations might be linked to your own <laughs> core values and beliefs, and then how that impacts your decision-making process. In the interest of time, because we are supposed to be out of here at 2.30, right? Okay, so I'm gonna move us over, okay.
So when you're, when you're dealing with paradoxical approaches, it's really important that you're addressing the specific need, okay? And not just doing something because it's fun, <laughs> which it's tempting, okay? But you can really end up getting out on a limb sometimes with paradoxical approaches, especially if you're